Hey everybody, my name is Sam Solomon and this is Signal Tower. Today I'm joined by Kelly Sutton, who is the founder of Layer Vault, a tool which provides version control for designers. Kelly also helped create Designer News, which is the popular online community for people in tech and design. Kelly Sutton, thank you for joining me. Sam, thanks for having me, man. Let's begin the show. Um, if you would, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Yeah, so my name is uh, Kelly Sutton. I am the CEO of Layer Vault, which is, a, as, you, as you mentioned, a company based here in New York City. Uh, the company itself is eight people. We are half, uh, half remote, so we got four guys in New York and then four guys uh, throughout the rest of the United States. Uh, most people probably know us for Designer News, which is Hacker News, but blue and for designers. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and we've been, uh, we've been at that for about three and a half years now. I love that. Hacker news, but blue and for designers. Yeah. I mean, it's the, it's the easiest <laughs> way to describe it. That uh, is, it if is. You, if you, you, you know what, you know what you're getting. Well, I want to talk about layer vault and I want to talk about designer news, but before we get there, I, you know, I kind of want to understand who you are. And so I'd like to take a, a couple steps back and talk about some of your previous projects. Yeah, um, for sure. The one I'm most interested in is, is hacking college. Um, yeah, you started this blog called Hack uh, called Hack College. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So when I was in uh, college or university, as some parts of the world call it, uh, I started a blog called Hack College because I was a big fan of Life Hacker, uh, LifeHacker.com. Uh, and so back in 2006, 2007. Uh, I was kind of just like a bored college student, and you know, as a college student, you have a lot of spare cycles. Uh, so rather than just, well, I still did all of the normal college things, I should say, but I also started this blog called Hack College, which is just life hacker for college students. Uh, and I ran that, and then more people started coming on board, and more, uh, uh, yeah, we had like a solid like little team of like five or six folks that, I, that we still all keep in touch with. Uh, I ended up selling the site. Uh, to another company in 2011, yeah, 2011, um, just because I was no longer in college and I didn't really want to be the guy who was running a college blog when he was a <laughs> in the professional workforce, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I had ran that. We, it was a blog. It was a. It was a. I, I guess we had what, a what, podcast. Yeah. What was? I guess kind of what was you know I, what was. What was the core focus of it? Like, why why did you decide to start it? Yeah, Other than you well, had a lot of free time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a that's a terrible reason to do anything <laughs> usually. But uh, I, I felt like it, it really could uh, fill fill a certain niche, and we uh, like to like. So I started I started going to college in two thousand five. Um, and it was a very like weird time to be going to school because uh, YouTube hadn't YouTube existed, but it wasn't YouTube that we know it today. Right. Um, and also, like college is just a time where you're figuring a lot of stuff out. Like, <laughs> like for a lot of people, it's like the first time they do laundry. It's like the first time you know you have to like cook for yourself on a regular basis. Uh, uh, so you're figuring like all of this stuff out, and so. Well, we called it kind of like life hacking for college students. It was kind of, just, in a lot of ways, like how to be a normal human being uh, and how to like learn how to be a normal human being uh, when you're in college. Uh, and like the internet's a very fascinating place for that. And still today, I, I find myself going to the internet to learn like normal human being things right. uh, a lot more than maybe like traditionally you might you know ask a friend who knows a lot about it or ask your parents like, hey, how do I uh, what's like the right amount of bleach to put in uh, a load of laundry or something like that? Yes. So we kind of yeah, and we we tried to like take it take it pretty lightly. Um, so we had we ran the gamut from like like serious things to like silly things. Uh, so like in our uh, in our video podcast, we just had a section called "And Now for Someone Shotgunning a Beer," uh, which was just someone shotgunning a beer, and we would uh, <laughs> we just get video submissions of college students around the world. Uh, shotgunning beers. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, so we kept it uh, kept it pretty lighthearted. Well, and so the the first people that you said you know the the team kind of grew and grew. Where were those your friends at school? Were they people that saw the blog and reached out and said, "Hey, can I write for this?" How how did you get in touch with them? Yeah, so I started it in 
So when the site started in September of 2006, uh, it was just me. And then like two or three months later, I met uh, a young woman online named Rosario, uh, who, where was she at the time? She was an undergrad at Yale, ended up going to uh, USC Law School. Uh, so she helped out with the site early on. Um, and she would write posts. Uh, and then my good buddy from school, who's still a good buddy of mine, uh, Chris Lazinski, kind of came on board, I think, like the that March, so like March of 2007. And then so that was kind of like the core team for a while. Uh, right. And then as we grew, uh, you know, we, we knew we were all like leaving uh, undergrad eventually. So it was time to start thinking about like a contingency plan of like what is like the next... Uh, uh, like the next uh, shift to look like. And so like uh, that's when a few other folks like Mike Bertolino, Laura uh, Schluckbeer, Emily Chapman, Shep McAllister, uh, and a few other folks came on board and kind of they, they took over when, uh, when I was uh, out of school uh, for a little bit there. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of your other projects was called the the Cult of Less, and yes. I'm I, I'm interested in this because I'm a minimalist. Like people come over to my apartment, and it's like it's like this. It looks like everyone's like, "Did you just move in?" Yeah. Um, because I don't like owning things either. But um, so uh, the Cult of Less is kind of this this project you started and got covered. You were covered on Boing Boing. This was like I think 2010. Yep. Um, and you built a website to kind of help you get rid of stuff and talk about you and being in the, going through the process of getting rid of stuff. Um, and your goal was, I think, to fit everything into two suitcases and two boxes. Yep. Um, I guess, what made you want to get rid of everything? Uh, yeah, so I was, uh, so the Cult of Less, as you, as you mentioned, started in 2010. Uh, and I was traveling around a lot. So I was... The summer before, I had an internship in San Francisco. I was, let me, uh, or no, the idea for the Cult of Less started in 2009. Anyway, um, one summer uh, in between uh, uh, in between the school year, I was living in Berlin for a little bit, and then also New York for a little bit, and that's kind of where the idea came about, because uh, I had to leave a lot of stuff behind with friends in Los Angeles where I was going to school. And... Uh, it was to the point where I was gone for like four months out of the summer and when I got back to LA I couldn't remember all the stuff that I had with me uh, so that's when I kind of started the site uh, I, at that point I also knew that I was moving out to uh, New York for a job upon graduation um, and rather than kind of go like list all this stuff on eBay and Craigslist which I did a little bit I rather listed everything on a site that I built myself because you know I'm a I'm an engineer by trade, so when an engineer has a problem, they, they often think, like, well, what can I build to solve this problem? Uh, so that's kind of how, like, the site came about. Um, and then I was doing that for about a year, uh, and then the first piece of press, and then I got extremely popular, kind of just, like, overnight, and that was due to a piece that the BBC Online, uh, yeah, BBC Online wrote, uh, and then everyone else kind of followed suit. Boing Boing, Boing Boing picked it up. Uh, lots of, uh, lots. I mean, just everyone uh, was fascinated by it for about a month, uh, including NBC Nightly News. Uh, so I believe Brian Williams has said my name before. That's pretty neat. That it, yeah, that put that on your resume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, at the top. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and so I still, I still do my best to kind of like follow, uh, follow the tenets of the cult. Less I've caved recently, though. I bought a couch. Um, but I do, I do very much try to be aware of what I'm purchasing and I try to purchase as little as possible. Um, so, so you only recently, this was four years ago and you only recently bought a couch? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so like the, like the dirty secret of like the cult of less is that the apartments that I've been living in have all been furnished uh, so the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not like, I haven't been like sleeping on a floor without any sheets, uh, for this whole time. Uh, so you know, you always cheat in, yeah. in things here and there, but at the same time, it's the, I guess it's the idea um, that you shouldn't be needlessly buying stuff all the time. So, Well, uh, I'm curious, what about stuff with, with you know, personal meaning? Is there any, any of that stuff that you regret giving away, or is there any stuff you regret giving away? Um... 
Surpri- what about the sentimental stuff? Yeah, uh, surprisingly, there isn't that much. I didn't have like a whole lot of sentimental stuff, um, or, or like little like kind of like tchotchkes that remind you of different things in your life. So that wasn't that hard, uh, and that was a, that might have been like the easiest stuff to give away because like really most of like your memories these days are digital and online or on your hard drive anyway. Right. Uh, so as long as you like back those up, uh, it's not so you're not in danger of like losing losing the things that remind you of those other points in your life. Um, so that's pretty fascinating. What about uh, like birthdays or holidays or things when people want to give you stuff? Do you just tell people, no, please don't give me stuff? Um, yeah, I mean, they, you know, my family and, and my friends kind of know that I'm, I'm the cult of less guy, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, they know, they know, like, unless it's really, really good or unless it's like replacing something that I, that I own that's like worn out. Uh, I probably don't don't want it, but uh, that's a that's a it's always a fine line that you have to that you have to walk um, since you don't want to be rude when accepting a gift. Well, um, since you started that project, do you think that's uh, had an effect on how you perceive money? Oh, totally. Yeah. So, like all uh, all of what I usually spend money on these days. Um, <laughs> makes me sound like I spend a lot of money. Uh, all of what I spend money on these days is mostly just experiences. Um, and rather than saving up to own something, I usually like save up for like a certain experience, like a like a trip or uh, I don't know, just something fun with friends, like a big dinner with friends or something like that. Have you um, t- Oh, go ahead. I sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, and so it's just a uh, you know, although like these these experiences and these things are very like short lived, uh, I find myself. I don't know, thinking back on them much more fondly than you would just like that like set of speakers that just kind of sits in that room that you never go into, right? <laughs> um, I guess what 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 are some of the trips and stuff you've taken? Yeah, so when uh, and I guess this kind of like gets into Layer Vaults and Hack College and kind of like what I did with the with the small amount of money that we got from Hack College is that. Uh, after selling Hack College, I, I was in this position where I didn't really need to uh, uh, work for about a year. Um, so rather than, I guess, kind of like sit around uh, in New York, uh, I decided I was going to travel and kind of work on this like Lair Vault thing that we were starting up at the time. And uh, so my first stop was going to be Berlin since that's, that was pretty familiar territory for me at that point. Uh, in my life, and then I ended up meeting my girlfriend there, uh, and got stuck there for three months. So I was going to travel around the world uh, until I met this nice, uh, this nice girl, and I guess the rest is, rest is history. <laughs> well, so that's that's interesting because you sold um, your hat college blog. You yeah. kind of had a little bit of a cushion where you didn't need to like go out and get a job to pay rent or do yeah. whatever. You had had a bit of a cushion that allowed you to actually start Layer Vault. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, and I mean the it's pretty easy to rent your apartment out for like a month or two uh, in New York. Uh, so I just found a friend of a friend that was that needed a place to crash uh, and was willing to pay rent. Uh, so she just moved into my apartment, and off I off I went with not really knowing what I was going to do or where I was going to end up. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. Well. Um... So I guess let, let's actually let that that's a perfect segue into Layer Vault. So you created yeah. it with Alan uh, Grinstein, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yep. I guess while you you had all you had a year or however long to 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 work on something, why did you come up with this version control system for PSDs and such? Yeah. So the idea for Layer Vault was kind of born out of like a personal need of of both Alan and my own. We were working at Blip a little startup in New York called Blip TV at the time. And we sat next to each other and got into plenty of trouble uh, regularly. But uh, one day Alan was trying to, he was working on a redesign of the site. And he was trying to kind of keep track of his work, uh, uh, which he was doing in Photoshop, you know, mocking up new versions of the site in Photoshop. Uh, And he was having like a lot of, a lot of trouble because technically how Git works, it's not built for like these large, complicated documents like right. this. Um, 
And so he just kind of like leaned over to me and he's like, Kelly, can you like build something for me to just like handle this? So we wrote, uh, I wrote a gross like Ruby script over the weekend that plugged into like a Rails server. Um, and all it would do is when you would save a file, it would just like, you know, show the PSD online. Uh, essentially, and it was like really, it was so, so gross. I don't even think there was any like CSS attached to it. It was just like actually just image tags that would just show up uh, on the page. Uh, and we were like, okay, there's, there's actually something here. So we, uh, we spent a little bit of time on it, got the rest of, uh, uh, got the, rest of the company kind of using it. Uh, and then we both uh, uh, left Blip to kind of work on Layer Vault and do our own thing full time. Um, and we both worked at a company called Gilt for a little while, and then, uh, but I didn't, I didn't make it very long there since I had also just uh, uh, sold Hack College, so I was able to quit and start traveling the world. So, and so, were, was I guess after you guys, after you were basically out on your own working on Layer Vault, mm-hmm. was was like Blip one of your first customers, or who el- who else, who else? Decided they wanted to use this. How did that? How did you find your first the, your first paying customers? Yeah, so our first uh, our first paying customers were just well, other than our well, I guess we weren't really paying ourselves, uh, <laughs> but you know, our first customers were ourselves, right? Uh, and then our first paying customers, who are still paying us to these to this day, actually, uh, were Ian Storm Taylor and a guy named Ty- Tyler Howarth. Um, Ian works at uh, a company called Segment. And Tyler works for a company called Pushed. Um, Very cool. And we were, so in the early days, we were going to actually bootstrap uh, Layer Vault, which we kind of failed at doing. But we were pretty gung-ho on, on the idea of like bootstrapping this business. Um, so we were, we were charging for the product within the first three months, uh, which was pretty aggressive in retrospect. Uh, and yeah, that's kind of that's how we... And both, Ian, well, I didn't, I didn't know Ian. He learned about Layer Vault just through our like, you know, demo videos. But I had known Tyler for years. Uh, I mean, I guess I've known Tyler since 2008, so about six years. You said uh, that uh, you guys were planning on bootstrapping, but didn't. Um, yeah. I, what What happened with that? Um, so with SaaS businesses, usually the the revenue ramp tends to be a little bit slower, especially in the early days, uh, until you kind of like get things figured out. So we we had been we spent like a year on uh, on Layer Vaults, and we were also running our the costs for Layer Vault tend to be more of like a step function. So uh, as we kind of like move the ball forward, like our costs, like you know, we need to really upgrade the hardware to make sure the customer experience doesn't degrade. Right. Um, and we had like a lot of kind of like these like good problems to have about a year in. Uh, where it did make sense to actually take a little bit of seed financing to kind of uh, jumpstart certain things that would have happened over time anyway, but uh, it would have taken like another like three or four years, and the experience wouldn't have been the greatest. We had some pretty uh, uh, we had some problems that money would solve essentially. Did you have any pushback from customers from current customers? Did you leave them at the same price tier and only started charging new customers? How did that How did that transition work? Yeah, so we've uh, we've so we've always charged uh, for layer vaults, and the uh, essentially uh, us us taking on funding had no out, out or to the customer it had no it didn't affect their experience at all. If anything, it just made them uh, made their experience better because it made we it meant we had resources to kind of th- throw money at the problems that they were having. So with the service. Um. I guess what what was your to this day? What's your big? What has been your biggest obstacle with Layer Vault? So the biggest obstacle with Layer Vault, I would say, has always been uh, underestimating the technical complexity of things that are very uh, that from the outset seem very simple, um, which I guess is just a normal you know engineering thing to do. You you just say like, well, this is this can take me more than like a few hours to fix. Uh, and then, like a, a month later or something, like oh, this is a this is a complicated problem. And so the uh, for us, the thing that that took a very very long time to get right uh, has been our syncing technology. So syncing 
is something that you see like a lot of businesses doing these days. Right. But it uh, it is a deceptively simple problem. Like uh, there is so much, I guess, logic and so many edge cases that go into syncing that even even like the big established players have a very very hard time getting it just right. Uh, so we've basically spent a lot of time uh, and a lot of effort uh, just going over syncing again and again and again and making sure it's it's actually just enterprise grade, which it is today. Uh, and now we actually have people switching to us from a lot of like the other big guys uh, because uh, we've focused on syncing for so long that it's actually better than just about anyone else's out there. So that's, that's awesome. uh, yeah, but it's also something that we thought you know, would be solved and we'd have it like out of the way in like a few months. Uh, turns out it's, it's essentially never done um, just because of changes in, changes in applications, changes in operating systems, like, and we still don't support Windows. Um, so this is just like, this is just our Mac client syncing to uh, the rest of the service. So it takes a, it is a Herculean effort to, I guess, make sure that that runs smoothly. Um, because it is the type of thing that just needs to be like set it and forget it. That's interesting. So is that because you know mostly the mostly designers ha are on Macs? Is that why? Uh... Yeah, yeah. Most of uh, most of the customers that we wanted to build the initial product for, namely like ourselves and kind of our friends, uh, uh, they all used Macs. Uh, now we're kind of getting into the situation where a lot. Uh, the average size of the company that's using Laravel is growing quite a bit. Uh, so once once design teams start growing or you start catering to larger design teams, uh, you do see a few like Windows computers in the mix. So uh, it's something that we'll need to address pretty soon. Well, and I guess moving forward, what what challenges do you see? So the Laravel product right now is pretty interesting. Like we don't need any new features. Uh, we just need to kind of uh, make sure the experience stays consistent and consistently good and just do a lot of the just do a lot of like the refinements right because a lot of times what people what our customers use layer vault for is to just more like a just to have a peace of mind in how they work right um, so everything needs to be perfect right uh, and that's essentially the best way that we think about how uh, how to kind of grow also our customer base, just make the current customers very, very happy uh, and unable to live without us. So, And um, so one of the things I, I think is interesting about, about companies is, uh, is their side projects. And so you guys mm -hmm. have like Cosmos, which is like all your open source projects and delivery and yeah. uh, Designer News, which I don't know if I preface this uh, at the beginning, which is probably, it's one of my favorite sites on the internet. Um, yeah. What impact have these projects had on, on Layer Vault? Yeah, so sometimes, so side projects are very dangerous, right? Because sometimes they can really split your focus uh, and take you in directions that might not be the best directions to go in. Because um, rather than having, you know, uh, one great product, you have two, like, okay products, which I don't, uh, uh, we're trying to get a little bit away from that. Right. Uh, but things, but you know, so things like our, our Cosmos project, which is just open sourcing some of the, some of the technology that we built and, uh, and kind of giving back to the community a little bit, uh, that doesn't take a whole lot of effort. That's just a, that's just like a single, like a, a page that we can throw up and link to these things that we would, uh, release anyway. Right. Um, and then things like designer news, designer news is, is tough. Uh, but it's amazing. Like that, designer news has just exceeded all expectations wildly. And so, how designer news came up, and how I guess like the rest of our side projects kind of came up, were just uh, uh, we had an idea. You know, you, you kind of like let that idea cook for a little while, and and you start building the idea and and playing around with different impl implementations of it. Uh, and we actually put Designer News online December 31st, 2012. Uh, and by the time we woke up uh, after uh, New Year's festivities, we already had 100 users and the thing was off to the races. That's uh, awesome. And, and yeah, and then, and then it's just been a matter of kind of making sure that that grows in a, in a healthy way uh, over time. So, 
that that is that is the one side project that is uh has been a good good side project good good side project i would say what why, I guess why why did you decide there needed to be a Hacker News for designers? What was the motivation behind that? We were yeah we were reading Hacker News a lot and we actually saw a lot of the designer voices uh, whether they're UX designers UI designers um, kind of everyone on I guess that side of the aisle a little bit uh, they were getting drowned out by a primarily primarily uh, engineering community right. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we saw an opportunity for to make this for designers kind of like the yin to their yang. Um, and I think both communities are very important, and I think it's very important to have these like very focused discussions around uh, different technologies that you might find on Hacker News. Uh, but it's also equally important to have uh, discussions around best practices on on uh, certain patterns, like on designer news and, and so forth. So we were and we were reading Hacker News a lot, and we're like, why don't we just make designer, designer news? <laughs> uh, um, and the rest is history. And I'm curious why uh, you know instead of instead of using like a traditional forum model, why kind of go mm -hmm. after the Reddit Hacker News? Um, what was some of the thought process there? Yeah, so I mean, the thought process there was to provide something familiar but also flexible uh, in two ways that we can kind of build. Uh, build on it and uh, and make our make it our own, right? So, the very first versions of designer news were actually just you know hacker news, but blue and for designers. Um, but now it's kind of grown into this thing with a lot more of its own character. Uh, like designer news tends to be a lot more colorful. Uh, we have some nice badges on every story. One of the most amazing things is the has been the pixel avatars to yeah. see what people build with those, and that was just a uh, that is the type of thing that can only exist on designer news and really nowhere else in the world. So it's, uh, uh, it, yeah, I guess you, you, we kind of started with the seed of, seed of the idea um, and something that was approachable and familiar to a lot of our, our audience and then kind of just took it to the nth degree, I guess. Well, and so now you guys have, you know, I think within this past year, you guys started doing meetups and, and things like that and started hosting events. How did those go? Uh, yeah, so the meetups have been amazing. Uh, I went to eight of the ten that we put on in uh, the month of September, just just to kind of meet everyone. Uh, uh, yeah, everyone who's been reading the site. Uh, I, I think it's just a, an extension of the site itself. Like it's important to not only have like a, a good, respectful place to have discussions online. Uh, but I think it's also very important to meet other people in the local community uh, that you might not otherwise meet. Definitely, um, I mean, definitely, yeah. It's yeah. Uh, that's a that, I think that's definitely important. Yeah. Um, well, so kind of moving forward, what you know, what types of things can we expect from Designer News? From uh, Designer News, I think the the crucial thing for us, uh, and it's always been the most important thing, is to make sure the quality stays high. Uh, as things uh, tend to grow, so Designer News has, I believe, it's quadrupled in size uh, in like every single metric in the last twelve months. Amazing. Um, so, but obviously, when that happens, uh, things change. Uh, different. Uh, the, yeah, the community just starts to look a little bit different, um, and. When that happens in the past, just based on our own observations, is that the quality tends to decrease, like the average quality of either the discussions or the story submitted um, tends to decrease. So for us, it's very important to make sure that the quality stays there. Uh, and if anything, if we can actually improve the quality as the site grows, uh, that would also be great. Um, and really to just may remain like an honest community for designers. Great. Well, um, we're kind of getting towards the end of the interview. Do you have any, um, is there any advice for entrepreneurs you'd like to share? Uh, I always, I always get asked this question and my answer always changes. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe that's the answer. I guess the answer might just be to be flexible, uh, to sometimes you really have to roll with the punches no matter what uh what comes your way that's a little vague though so let's uh 
let's get specific here. What's a good What's a good piece of advice? Another uh, maybe would, another way to think about it is: Is yeah. there a question I should have but didn't ask you? No, no, I don't think so. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I think the the uh, yeah the the best thing or the thing that's helped me the most has been always to build and use the products that I create and use them on a daily basis. I think that's like the most important uh, thing. So when you build something, you should be ready to use it on a daily basis for uh, essentially the life of the thing, right? Right. Uh, so with Hack College, Hack College was a site that I wanted to read, uh, so I created it. Like Cult of Less was the thing that I wanted. Uh, it was the way that I wanted to kind of put a yard sale online, uh, so I did uh, Layer Vault was something that I wanted to see exist in the world, so we created it. Um, and still to this day, like we use Layer Vault every day to build Layer Vault. So we know uh, every single thing that's wrong with the, with the service, and we don't have to uh, ask people uh, or, or poke them to say, like, hey, what's wrong? Uh, we know, uh, and it's on our radar. So That's great. Yeah. Well, Kelly Sutton, thank you for joining me today. Where can people find you? Uh, people can just find us on LayerVault.com. Uh, you can sign up for free, free 30-day trial. Uh, if you're looking for me, I'm on Twitter, Kelly Sutton. I'm on the web, kellysutton.com. tend to be Kelly Sutton just about wherever you go. <laughs> great. Well, thanks for joining me. Yeah, great. Uh, Sam, thanks for having me.